shave. Right, you guys we're gonna get started want to open in prayer this morning we'll be we'll be in first Kings chapter 42 first Kings 42 there is no first Kings 42 I was gonna say the book of Hezekiah so many people would have turned there good morning everybody it's good to see everybody here this morning I want to welcome that one person online God bless you uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's well, uh, great to have Steve Cody back. He was uh, out of uh, just out, and so it's good to have you back. That's our golf partner. We haven't played golf in what a month. That's that's almost like backslidden state right there. That's as probably you get that's as close as you can probably get to backsliding right there. <laughs> Let's open in prayer, you guys. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. And we're thankful here that, Lord, that we're able to come here this morning and, uh, Lord, just hear from your spirit. So, Lord, guide us as we look at this last portion of, of Scripture. May your spirit move. May your spirit speak to us, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to give a, just a brief recognition to Max Sol who just, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, we've had a, a, young, a young man here coming pretty much every Tuesday and he's been doing our sound and our, uh, our scripture references. And he's going to be taking a little bit of a break. So, But I wanted to give uh, a, just a shout out to Donnie for being here faithfully and helping us all the time. He'll be on a little bit of a sabbatical, but I told him, you know, I'm keeping my eye on you, so we're going to use you when you get back. Uh, and so thank you, Donnie, for all you've done. Uh, this morning we're in 1 Kings chapter 15. I want to welcome those who are online. There's literally one person online, so welcome. Also, men, we have uh, our men's gathering tickets that will be on sale today. I got, I heard this, and it may be true, but I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. I heard this. Guys aren't signing up for the uh, gathering because they want to go away on a conference. That's probably one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. If, you, if we cannot come to God's word, whether it's in the mountains, whether it's here, whether it's wherever, then I would say we need to take a look within ourselves. And so uh, we're going to go where God's word is. We cannot, at this for this year, we're not going to the mountains, but we will eventually. But I got word back that the guys aren't signing up because they want to go to the mountains instead. We'll go. But just come back November 5th and 6th for our men's gathering. Tickets will be on sale, right? Enjoy your time. Just our conference is May, November 5th and 6th. And you know, we have a brother from our men's ministry that's going to be sharing. Uh, and if you guys want to know who it is, come get a ticket. And you guys will see who it is. Uh, and uh, we've asked. It's going to be a great time, you guys. And I just want to encourage you guys to sign up for that. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to get to back to the mountains soon. It's just with the pandemic, with the place that we usually go to is sold. And a lot of the places you guys... They, want, they didn't want, they will only house or only allow an X amount of people. That's also a hindrance. But I hope because we're not going away to the mountains, that's keeping you from coming and spending time in God's word and with other brothers. I hope that's not the case. If it is, you need to, I'm going to have you guys speak to Joe Vasquez afterwards. <laughs> He'll set you guys in order, right, Joe? Okay, 1 Kings chapter 15. We're now going to switch back to the northern kingdom. We've been in the south for a little bit of time with Asa, King Asa. Before him was Abijam. And the writer in chapter 15 
took us back to the south for a little bit of time. And now we're going to go back to the north and spend the rest of First Kings there. This is where all the action is going to take place. And we're going to see from this point forward pretty violent stuff. And it's going to get really interesting. Uh, I want to start off with a story. And then I'm going to close with the same story. But this story really ties in of what is taking place here because Nadab is now going to come into, into the scene who's the son of Jeroboam. If you remember with me, and we'll go back there in a moment, Jeroboam's son was sick. Remember in chapter 14? And he went to the prophet who was blind. He actually sent his wife to say, hey, our son is sick. Go speak to this prophet. And the prophet told him, why are you disguising yourself? We know that, right? We're going to go back and visit that here in a few moments. But now his son's in reign. And so Nadab is, or Nadab is the son who, would have, who took the place of the son that was sick. Why is that significant? Well, we'll take a look here in a few moments. The thing we're going to see about Nadab, he did, and when you look at, and we're going to take a look at here, but when you look at verse 26 of chapter 15, look what it describes about Nadab. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father, Jeroboam. In his sin by which he had made Israel sin. That's a pretty heavy duty description of somebody. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, as, as I was preparing this, I, I was thinking about doing evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, when, when we do evil in the sight of the Lord, a lot of times that evil is done in secret. We don't spend a whole lot of time doing our evil deeds out in the open. When it talks about that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, it's talking about that his way of life was an evil way of living before the Lord. And you know, as we're Christian men here, I wouldn't, as I'm looking across the crowd, I wouldn't necessarily say any of you are walking in the evil ways of the Lord. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> but we do have times in our lives where we may do things that are not pleasing to the Lord. And I want to start off with this story, and I'm going to close with the same story, of a man who was in India. And while he was in his hotel room, he was in an area, part of India, where it had many different rivers and bodies of water that he was able to see. And, and one morning he woke up and he was, as he was looking across this lake, he notices a woman that is bathing. And as he's looking at her, she, he notices that she sees him looking at her and does nothing. And she looks at him and she continues to bathe and She's naked and she's bathing and he looked at her and with her looking back at him and not going, oh my gosh, she just kept bathing. That was his invitation to go to her. So he got this little skiff and he jumped on there and he began to paddle towards her. And she would look back at him and see him and, and he would see her and as his lust started growing, he began to paddle faster and faster. And he began to paddle and she would look back and kind of smile at him. And when he got there, he noticed that she was a leper. But it didn't stop him. And oftentimes, sin can appear that way to us. It can be inviting. It can look sexual. It can look good. It can look voluptuous. It can look a lot of many different ways until we get up there and we get into it. 
we finally find out what sin really is. See, that man didn't stop there. He didn't care. And we see Nadab here in verse 25 tells us that he's the son of Jeroboam and that he became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. So we see right away that Nadab, Nadab's reign is very brief. The kingdom is now shifted to the north. And we see that Nadab, when you go back to chapter 14, verse 20, very briefly, the writer tells us that Nadab reigned, his son reigned in his place regarding Jeroboam. We've been, we've been prepared for Nadab, Nadab's reign here. When we look back at uh, 1 Kings chapter 14, and I want us to go back there because the writer is doing something interesting here, men. I would tell you all along that the writer's preparing us for something. And here, we look back at chapter 14, and we will see what the writer has prepared us for up to this point. If you remember with me, if you go back to chapter 14, look at verse 7. It says, Go tell Jeroboam, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. And yet you have not been as my servant David who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. Look what he says in verse nine. But you have done more evil than all you who were before you. You have gone and made yourself other gods and molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, I will bring disaster upon the house uh, on the house of Jeroboam and I will cut off from Jeroboam every male Israel in Israel bond and free and I will take the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuse until it's gone and the dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam and dies in the city and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field for the Lord has spoken so the writer there was preparing us for Jeroboam's dynasty to be taken away. And now that prophetic word of this prophet is now going to take place. Nadab will be the last son of Jeroboam that will ever reign in the kingdom. He will eventually, as we will see, he will be killed. He will be assassinated. And so we see here in verse 25 that Nadam, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel in the second year of Asa. Remember with me that from this point on, when the writer begins to introduce a new king, he will always give a backdrop of the king reigning in the opposing kingdom. So we see that it was during Asa's reign that Nadab became king. We know that because in chapter 14 that Jeroboam's son died, he will be the brother of the son that, was, that had died and became the oldest living son who is now in line to be king. And so we see here that at Nadab in verse 26 did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, man, sometimes as, and again, I, 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 when I was looking at these guys over here, I'm joking. Of course, we know that doing evil in the sight of the Lord is, is a lifestyle, right? We know that it's walking in the ways of evil. And somebody who has given their heart to Jesus Christ does no longer walk in the evil ways of their sins or in the sins of the world. But I often wonder with those who have named themselves Christians nominally or they consider themselves Christians, how is it that they're able to still walk in the ways of the world, thinking that they are able to get away with it? 
Sometimes even as Christians, as I shared with you guys last week, there were things that I thought I can get away with. I thought I can live ways, the ways of the world and still follow Christ. But men, when we walk in Christ, we're, walking, we're either walking in Jesus Christ or we're not. And if we're not walking in Christ, we're walking in the ways of the world. We're walking in the ways, evil ways before the Lord. There's no middle ground in our walk, you guys. This is why in Ephesians it says to walk worthy, to walk circumspectly, to walk in the light, to walk not as the Gentiles has walked. We've been instructed to walk in the ways of the Lord. And when we walk in God's ways, there's no way we can actually walk in the ways that are evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a man, I must examine my heart every single day to see which way I'm walking because a lot of times I can think I'm walking in the ways of God when in actuality, I'm not. And again, there's a lot of Christians that say, I'm a brother in the Lord. I think it was Dave that was telling me we were going on some trip, Dave. I, he just recently was telling me that there was a conference going on and before the conference there was a worship team at a local restaurant drinking beer and the conference didn't even start and they went and drank beer and went and did worship for this I think it was a crusade a conference I don't know what it was and somebody went up to them afterwards and said I saw you guys at the restaurant before the conference. How was your beer? See, there's people that are in, in word only are walking in the ways of the Lord, but their hearts and their way of walking demonstrate something else. Because it looks so appealing, just as this lady did in, with this man who was in lust after her and pursued her only to get up to her and see that she was a leper. Men, where are our hearts this morning? Are, we, are there things in our lives that we have to examine that we must remove because it will hinder our walk? You know, we have a great men's ministry here. I know I can call any of you at any moment and ask you to help my wife take out the trash. So I want to see if you guys are listening. She takes it all the time, man. She takes the trash out. <laughs> you guys, okay. My wife doesn't watch this, so I'm good, right? <laughs> if I'm not here next Tuesday, you're going to know. Steve would know this. Ray would know this because they're... I'm around them a lot. I think Bobby would, Dave definitely knows this. So oftentimes when we're in the office, I, I have a lot of secretaries, right? We both do, Dave. Dave has like 15 secretaries and I think I have three. But we have a lot of secretaries here in the office that help us with the different ministries. And sometimes they'll be congregated in one office and I'll say, hey guys, I'm gonna tell you like I have it at home. I'm gonna call my wife and I'm gonna tell you, show, I'm gonna show you guys how I got it at home. So I'll put her on speakerphone and I'm calling my wife and she'll say, hi, honey. I was like, honey or Livy, this is what you're going to do and you're going to like it. And they just laugh at me, right? They know better. So one time I said, okay, I'm going to show you. So I got home from work one time and my wife was mopping as she should be. <laughs> Dave, want to take over from here? <laughs> She was mopping, right? And I recorded her and I sent it to the girls. I see guys, this is how I have it at the house. See, this is how, this is how it's really to be done. See, this is how I got my, and I was going on and on and on. And my wife says, if you don't put that camera down, you're going to find this broom in an uncomfortable spot. So, <laughs> over my head. <laughs> Why am I saying all of this and put me out there for me to get in trouble? is because we can often say things and not walk in those ways. 
We can often fool ourselves that we're in a good place, but if we really don't examine our hearts here, we can easily fall into the trap of being a Nadab. Maybe, so, maybe not so blatant or so obvious, but we can. And we can see here that he became king over Israel, and he reigned there two years. Now, what's interesting about this is that he is now recognized by something I hope we are never recognized, but by God's grace we're not. Because look what it says in verse 26, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father. You know, from this point on, men, any time there is a king that comes uh, from the north, he will be referenced as, as, uh, as did Jeroboam, son of Nebat. You know, when I was getting clean, you guys, I was oftentimes, I would get clean and then I would fall back. I would get clean and then I would fall back. I would go to church, I would get clean, I would serve, I'd be on fire for the Lord, and then I would give me a couple of years, I'm right back where I started, right? And oftentimes, uh, when I would go back to the church I was going to, they say, it's you again? Nothing's changed. And I became referenced as the one who backslides. There's John, and I was a junior. There's John Mata Jr. who he's at it again. Just give it some time. I had created a name for myself among the church, among my fellow believers. And it wasn't a good name because it was, oh, here he is again. Just give it X, Y, Z amount of time and he will be back here. This is what we see here with, with Nadab. It says that in verse 26 that he walked in the ways of his father and, in, and by his sin, by which he made all Israel sin. How are we being viewed by those around us? Are we being viewed as men of God? Are we being viewed as Max the, or Sugar Bear the, how are we being viewed? See, a lot of times by our way of living, it's going to give a loud and clear message to all of our around us who we truly are. And who we truly are will lead people in the direction we're going because look what it says here at the end of verse 26 is that he walked in the way of his father and sinned by which he had made Israel sin. Your family's watching you. Your wife is watching you. The people at your job are watching you. Your friends are watching you. And how you will respond to certain things and how you live your life out will a lot of times dictate the direction they're going to go. He led Israel to sin. That's heavy. I don't know if any of you guys would want to be recognized and described as verse 26. But the writer here now chooses to show one event in this king's life. One event. Chronicles doesn't even have a record of him, as we looked at last week. There's one event here. When we pick up in verse 26 again, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 27, we're now introduced to a rivalry within the kingdom. Then Baasha, son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha killed him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And it was so, when he became king, that he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed until he had destroyed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servant, Ahijah the Shilonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned, and by which he had made Israel sin, because of his provocation, which, which he had provoked the Lord, God of Israel to anger. So out of all that brief reign that Nadab reigned, 
The writer chooses just one event to look at. And from this description, we're able to put not only Jeroboam's kingdom in perspective, but all the sin that Jeroboam has done. You see now what the writer has done? Remember when Jeroboam set up the two places of false worship? Remember when he instituted the false religion? He was trying to draw people to himself. Remember when he even was making up priests as they go, just asking anybody to be a priest, defiling the temple? He's the one that on the Mount of Olives raised up a high place that would be in competition to the true place of worship in Jerusalem. This is the result. This is the result of sin. This is the promise that was given in chapter 14 when he says, I shall cut off and destroy the house of Jeroboam. See how God views sin? Sin must drastically be cut off. It cannot linger around. It cannot be used as a pet. It cannot be used as a pleasure. It cannot be used. And we see the result here in verse 29 that he did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed until he destroyed him. We must have that same view of sin. But now we're introduced to Baasha. We first met him in chapter 15, verse 16. He was just introduced briefly. We learned that he became, an, uh, we met Basha earlier and learned that he became king of Israel in chapter 15, verse 16, because it says that there was war with Asa and Baasha. So he was introduced at this time as king. So at that time, Baasha already had killed Nadab. And we're going to see these gruesome types of wars and assassinations as a result of sin throughout the, worst, throughout the book of Kings. And now he's introduced properly. He was the son of Ahijah, but he's not this, this is not the same Ahijah that we saw in chapter, uh, that we saw earlier in chapter 14. But this is the one from chapter 14, verse 14, where it says, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. It tells us he's from Issachar. And the tribe of Issachar was uh, west of the Jordan River, just below the Sea of Galilee. Commentators point out that none of these details suggest that Baasha had any natural claim to leadership. He wasn't an heir to anybody. He just raised himself up. But what's interesting, you guys, as we see in verse 27, that this conspiracy came forth because it says that uh, Baasha conspired against him. What's really interesting about this is that even when we look at in verse 28, Baasha killed him. So he conspired and he killed. What's even more interesting is that in verse 29, it says, according to the word of the Lord. So does the word of the, does God use evil ways to fulfill his plan? Does God use ways we would look at that would be, wow, killing, murdering, assassinating to fulfill his word? How is his word going to be fulfilled? We knew that Jeroboam's house was going to be cut off. We know that there was going to be no one breathing in his house any longer. And yet it says the word of the Lord was fulfilled. We can tell by this that, uh, that uh, uh, I'm sorry, you guys, but Asha was a powerful man. No one stood in his way. And that he had taken the reins of power and launched a bloody massacre of anyone that rivaled him. The language here in verse 29, it, it, again, we read it from a Western perspective and we think, oh, he cut him off. 
But the language here in the Hebrew is pretty brutal. They, they make it clear that he left to the house of Jeroboam, not one person he breathed until he had destroyed it. This is pretty shocking. The whole family of Jeroboam was destroyed. As promised in chapter 14, verse 10, I will bring disaster to the house of Jeroboam and will cut off Jer every male in Israel. What's interesting is that Baasha was used to fulfill this promise. Whether he hated Nadab for some reason or just wanted to take power in his own hands, there's no suggestion that there was any regard to God whatsoever. We don't see Nadab or we don't see Baasha hearing from a prophet. We don't hear Baasha hearing from the word of the Lord. We don't see any of this going on here. It seems that he just took it upon himself as a violent, self-serving brute who took matters in his own hands. But what's interesting is that our writer tells us one more thing about Baasha and his murderous atrocity. It says at the end of verse, uh, second part of verse 29, according, he had done this according to the word of the Lord, which had been spoken by his servant, Ahijah the Shilonite. Baasha didn't hear from Ahijah the Shilonite. Jeroboam did. But what's so interesting about this? Was he acting in obedience to God's word? What would you guys say? Would you say that this man, Baasha, was acting according to, in obedience to God's word? Did he know he was? This does not mean that he was acting in obedience to God's word. We see in verse 30 that because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned by, which he had made Israel sin, he had, he, I'm sorry, which he had provoked the Lord of God of Israel to anger. Baasha was part of Israel. Israel was made to sin. So we see that Baasha was also one of those ones who did evil in the sight of the Lord. This can be disturbing. It can be amazing. Because we've been prepared to hear that the word of the Lord was spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite, but Ahijah did not say it would be such an evil man as Baasha. Are we to believe that the Lord raised up a bloody assassin, Baasha, for himself? Do you think the Lord responds in this way? Did Baasha have an idea that he was serving God? Did he have an idea that he wasn't serving God? What, what do you guys think? His actions were inexcusably evil, but God was able to accomplish his plan, his righteous purpose, with Baasha. And in verse 30, it says, And the sins of Jeroboam that had sinned, and that he made Israel to sin, and because of the anger to which he provoked the Lord God, provoked the Lord God of it. My notes have just got jacked up, you guys, so I'm going to have to wing it here. Does God still use that type of person? We see that Baasha was a murderer. We see that he killed everybody in Jeroboam's household. I mean, we're talking children, women, innocent people. Yet even though all of Israel was made to sin, what about those young males that were there? They were killed. But why were they killed? They were killed because of Jeroboam's sin that we saw earlier. 
And, and the Lord told that a prophet, Ahijah, saying that your house will be cut off and be destroyed. And yet, God in his sovereignty, even in the atrocities of this murderous man, Baasha, his will was still done according to his word. Does God use evil to fulfill his word? We see it here. Did Baasha know that he was acting in, in, I don't know if we would even call it obedience, but he was working in God's plan? Do you think he knew that? We see the deeds of Baasha gave expression to the Lord's grief and sorrow and anger at the deeds of Jeroboam as we've seen earlier. So what do we take away from this, men? Because we see here the rest of, it tells us in verses 31 and 32 that the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that they are written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, became king over all Israel in Terzah. And he reigned 24 years. What does verse 34 say? What does it say? It continues. When will it stop? When will this ever end? When will they ever learn? When will they see that this evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of Jeroboam and in his sin by which he made Israel sin? Imagine having that description attached to you, men. And here we have these kings in the north who have walked in the evil ways of their forefather, Jeroboam. How are you living your life out, men? What name is attached to you? What description is attached to you? Is it, maybe it's not as drastic as did evil in the sight of the Lord as his, his father, Jeroboam, and made all Israel sin? Maybe it's not that. But maybe it's compromise. Maybe it's busyness. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe, and it can be, and we all know it's not golf. Golf would never be attached to something like that. Guys. Even though I haven't played for a while. But what is it? What are you known by? What is it that you live by? What is it that people say about you? What is it? Bill Bonilla, he's a great guy. And he brings me Perrier water. See, I look across this room and I see a great work of what God has done in your lives. I see the great work and the great restoration in a lot of our lives that God has done for us. The great work that he's doing in all of our lives. I mean, if God wasn't doing here, I'd say we have, what, 50-something men here this morning? 50, 60 men, I don't know. God is doing a great work in your lives. We don't have the time to fall in disobedience because men already, the church that's to be strong, it's losing its power in these last days. We should, have, we should be men that is gaining momentum in power in these last days that we're living in. Unfortunately, the church, it's losing its strength because there are no men, and I'm not talking about our men, because men do not want to stand up for what's right anymore. Men have given away to the cares of the world. Right? Pastor David just did this random moment unfiltered about Demas. And he did a message one day that kind of sent shudders through my, my skin. I'd say it had, it had my hair sticking up, but I have no hair. <laughs> and he closed a message one time, you guys, and said, Demas, are you here? Demas, where are you? Demas, 
I know you're here. Where are you? And when he said that, that shook me up. Because is there a Demas in here? A Demas who wanted to live for the cares of the world versus a man who wanted to live for God? Why is the writer even telling us about Nadab and Baasha and all this murdering going on? Because Jeroboam listened to his own heart. Jeroboam began to develop false worship. He began to compromise. He began to set up things that are convenient. Men, this walk that we have for the Lord is not about conveniency. It's not about easy, because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's about being obedient to God. This is why we're instructed to pick up our cross daily to die to ourselves, because it's not about us, it's about Jesus Christ. This is the result of sin on sin on sin on sin. Men, let us be strong in God's word. Let us be reminded that their evil is real, and if not cut off, it will continue. For the first of rest of First Kings, you guys, we're going to see the North Kingdom and how this continues on and on. We only have five chapters left, six chapters left, which just takes about ten more years to get through. But we will continue to see sin after sin after sin after sin. Men, let us be men of God that stand up in these days and be strong in the Lord. I had lost most of my notes here. I don't know what happened to them, you guys, so my apologies. But going back to that story that I started with, how good does that really look? From a distance, it always looks great. But when we get up there and we really see what it is, but why do we keep falling for it? Men, let's be men that are strong. Let's be men that are obedient. And most of all, you guys, let's be men of God's word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much, Lord, that you're showing us, Lord, that sin is ongoing, Lord. We ask, Lord, for forgiveness for anything that we have raised up in our hearts that may have been a high place, Lord, that are high places, Lord, that we strike them down, that we be men that live for you, not for conveniency or for compromise, Lord, but for you only. Lord, we thank you that we're able to come here and spend time in your word. I ask that you be with the fellowship, Lord. Lord, I I taste a little bit of the meat that they're serving for the burritos, and it's bomb. Thank you for the guys that got here early to prepare it. For our brothers that came and helped set up the tables. Thank you, Lord. For the guys who made the salsa and the quesadillas and everything, Lord. It's not about that. It's about you, but thank you for the fellowship. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the two guys that are watching online. God bless you guys.